Uh, Morena, kia ora. Welcome this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Uwe Nukurake, to call five, but you can call me Dave. <laughs> Very briefly, because I won't be here for long. But um, we just want to first thank Helen and her team for having us here today to begin your conference with the Mihi Whakatau. And the question we usually get is what's the difference between a Mihi Whakatau and a Pohiri? A Pohiri happens on the Marae. That's the big difference, which has a whole lot of other elements that connect you. Mihi Whakatau's are bringing two groups together and starting the day correctly, but most importantly, having that dialogue so you can move through um, your, um, your kaupapa or your purpose for today. And also having the um, support of the mana whenua hapū here in, uh, in uh, Ōtautahi, otherwise known as um, our hapū Ngaitu Huriri and our iwi is Ngaitahu. So without going on too much about that, I just want to um, give you a quick rundown on what we're doing this morning. So first we will do our mihi whakatau and then we will do a waiata and then your lovely um, kaimahi here will do a, a waiata in reply and then we will have... Um, I think John beaming in from Starship Enterprise somewhere up in <laughs> Auckland, I think, isn't it? And over here to my left is Tamatea. He's just watching the room in case anybody tries to run out the door. <laughs> That's the wrong door, obviously. Aino tato, e omana mato ki roto ki tau pa e te hata mata o te atua. Awa kwe faka kino ki o mato ingo e o mato mate e ngari faka rangi mato. Ake ake e ngā mea makatū katoa te takakau whakakoroia tia a whakapaingia. Amen. Kapa kapa te manu i runga rere atu rā ki tāwhiti nuku ki a runga wai koe tapu tapu o whakātau. Koe rangi tuku a koe rangi hori a tū wana wana tū mai hi tū wana wana rere ki te pano te pipi wharau rō tihei wā mauri ora. Ke aku nui, ke aku rahi, tēnei te reo o tuahuriri e ngururu nei. E tuku nei o nga mihi a ki a tātou e pai nei, whake ke mai ki rongi o tautahi, ki rongo te atākoro, ke roro te maru o te pai. Koutou rā, ngā mana, ngā ihi, koutou ngā hapu ko e tau mai, whaka tau mai rā. A huri nō ki a koutou e pupuri nei, te mauri te o tēnei hui a tātou, a kā mihi koutou. Ki a ku nui, ki a ku ranga tira e noho nei, a tēnā koutou. Uh, e ngā hau e whā, tō e mai ngā maramatanga, ngā mōhi o tanga, ngā whakakitinga kia kaupapa te wā. Anō rērā, i aku, i aku nui, i aku rahi, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou katō. Manu tiria, manu tiria, manu Wenohia ki te poho te raka ka taurere re re tau mai te ruhi e tau e ia ko ia ko ia ko tararuri ki ki mai ma e hara i te vitu me te waru e e tau e ko ia so, ladies and gentlemen, just before um, we ask our lovely kaimahi to come up and do a waiata, I just want to give you a quick translation, and it's usually helpful. Um, and, and ultimately, when we start a mihi, we always go to our creator or your God, and we put a karaki up that wakes all the heavens of, of above us, and we have a, 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 a um, what we call a whakatoki, or a proverb. In this one, we talked about the birds, especially our sacred birds and those that are extinct, um, and the manu and the, and the glory that they brought here to Te Waipanamu and to Angahere. And then we came finally down to the people, or to you people that are here today, gathered in our rohe, Ngaitu Huriri, and for your hui and for your kaupapa today. And we know how important it is, and I've just found out that it's your first hui since um, COVID. So I'm sure there's some itching to do some great networking out there and, and some great support. Um, and that's the most important thing about, about these kaupapa is, is the support. And look at the lovely number of people here today. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I hand over to our, our lovely sopranos. <laughs> and you'll, you'll find the words on page 31.
that concludes our, our mihi whakatau, ladies and gentlemen. Very shortly, we're going to have John coming in. Peter. <laughs> Where did I get John? Peter. <laughs> and I just want to say there's a lovely waiata. Lots of trills and some melodies. A few part harmonies in there. <laughs> we run the shows as well, so we're looking for uh, staff if you want to rehearse, especially the big fella. <laughs> 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 ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you for having us here. I think I'm on time and in the right space to go that way and leave you to your lovely conference today. But most importantly, it's a wonderful day. And um, your energy in this room will change today dramatically. And it's been so long since you've been able to bring your energy together. Um, we're quite confident, sure, and I'm sure your organisers, it will be an awesome, successful event. So thank you very much for having us here, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to say one more word. Repeat after me. Matewa. See you soon. Thank you. Um, we are now going to have Peter um, Ferguson, who is our CEO. He's going to be uh, zooming in from Auckland to give an address. No mai haere mai. Ko Ramara te moanga. Ko Faranaki te awa. Ko Napui te iwi. Ko Hakutu te hapu. Ko Peter Ferguson taku ingoa. No rei rā. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā tātou koutou. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2023 Blood Cancer Patient Forum. My name is Peter Ferguson. Unfortunately, I'm coming to you virtually today. I've managed to spend a few days in hospital recently and I'm unable to travel for a while yet. So it's definitely my misfortune to miss one of the best events of this year. This year's Blood Cancer Patient Forum is particularly special. It's the first time in five years that we've been able to make this an in-person forum a reality. Unfortunately, our very best efforts over past years have been diverted into delivering online events, which I hope have been enjoyable, but we know that there's nothing quite like getting together in person. I'm conscious that it takes an incredible courage and determination for each of you to come together for a forum of this nature. And many of you have traveled long distances to be here. So a very, very big thank you for making that effort. Today, I want to encourage you to actively participate in these sessions, workshops and networks. We want the forum to be as active and interactive as possible. At this time, it's also difficult to miss the fact that we have an election in four weeks. With that in mind, we released an election manifesto on Wednesday, the 13th of September, to the media and all political ministers, detailing four key actions that has the collective support of New Zealand cancer agencies. The New Zealand Cancer, Agent, cancer Alliance, which represents nine national cancer agencies, has specified four key outcomes. They are the allocation of additional funds for PharmAct to implement a fast-tracked funding scheme for cancer medicines within 12 months, a dedicated budget for clinical research and the implementation of trials New Zealand-wide, a fully funded national travel assistance scheme, and urgent action to address the dire problems within the health workforce. Greater details of this manifesto are on our website, and while there are a raft of other concerns that we want to push and we will continue to do so, these core, four core issues resonate with all cancer groups. Finally, I would like to acknowledge our distinguished speakers who give their time and share their expertise with us today. I know you will also join me in thanking our dedicated support services team who have walks, worked so hard to bring this forum together. I'm very proud of my team. You guys are awesome. Please enjoy the day, be inquisitive, connect with new people, learn new things, and most importantly, be safe and have fun. Kakite Ano in the Hora. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name's Helen. And I'm Kate. And we are the support service coordinators based here in Christchurch, and we welcome all of you. We've got our team from around the country. And um, yeah, welcome you to our beautiful Christchurch city. We've put on a glorious spring day for you all, and I hope those that are visiting uh, make time to go and explore the city. Um, behind us, we've got the cardboard cathedral, we've got the new stadium being built, we've got the fabulous um, walkway around the River Avon, so do take time to explore. Um, 
Actually, where, where is everyone from? Hands up, people who are from the North Island. Wow, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for travelling so far. And our, our fabulous um, Nelson and, and Blenheim people, West Coast. Um, and some from down south, I think. Yeah, and, and of course all our fabulous um, Christchurch friends, welcome. First of all, we'll just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the toilets are just located through the lobby, just um, out here, and there are some more downstairs. Um, this is a snow no smoking venue as I'm sure you all would um, realize. Uh, food and drink today. So the morning and afternoon teas are gonna be here in the lobby. Um, it's a small lobby and there's a lot of people. So it, it, we just, just take your time um, and then you maybe want to move into some of the other rooms to, to have your, your drink. Um, this room here will actually be split into two. So if you've been looking on your and wondering where Savoy West and Savoy East and all of that, you look outside and, and that'll be above the rooms and the speakers. Um, lunch today will be held downstairs. It's buffet style, it'll be beautiful food. What else? Um, I think that's about it. <laughs> Let's look at my notes. Um, I, think that, I think that's about all, to, all we have to say. There is. Um, also out through into the executive boardroom, it's what we call the quiet space. So if there's maybe, um, you just want some um, time out, um, maybe there's not a talk you want to go to, um, we've got some of our support staff uh, manning it. There's, um, yeah, just puzzles and, and just books and things. So just take some time out for yourselves. If any of the speakers or, or anything um, evoke some emotions and you want to talk to some people, then we're all around the support staff are here to support you for today. So I'm going to hand over to Kate now to um, introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Helen. I'd just like to introduce our first speaker for um, our conference, 2023. Peter Browett is the uh, Professor of Pathology and Head of Department of Molecular Medicine and Pathology at the Auckland uh, University of Auckland School of Medicine and Consultant Hematologist at Auckland City Hospital. His involvement with leukaemia and blood cancer in New Zealand stems from his clinical interest in the management of patients with hematological malignancies, including bone marrow transplantation. In the laboratory, he has an interest in cell market and molecular studies in the diagnosis and monitoring of patients with leukaemia, lymphoma and inherited blood disorders. Peter has had a long association with LBC, acting as medical director and trustee for many years, as well as being part of LBC's independent medical scientific committee overseeing research grants. Please give a warm welcome for Professor Peter Browett. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you. <laughs> I'd have been hopeless if I hadn't been able to talk to some uh, slides. So look, thank you for the, thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, my name is, P is Peter Browart and I'm a hematologist. I've also run a research lab in, in, uh, in Auckland and the, our lab, Leukemia and Blood Cancer Research Unit, is supported by, uh, by LBC. And I'm also director of a university cancer centre, Tiaka, which is uh, which the LBC research unit sits under, and we sort of have a sort of a global interest across all the areas of uh, of sort of cancer. It's really exciting to talk to you about sort of the research and the field of hematology because of all the clinical disciplines, hematology is the one where research has really driven and improved uh, improved care and continues to do so. And so what I want to do is talk three topics. I uh, want to give you just an overview of the landscape of, of hematology research within the New Zealand environment. Secondly, I want to sort of 
talk to you as to why, why we see research as being so important, why it's important that we support research uh, within the New Zealand environment. And thirdly, to sort of say, well, where are we going? What are the advances going to be? What are the changes that are going to happen over the next, uh, the next five to 10 years? So if we look at the landscape and, and where you as patients and whānau probably link with us in research is around the area of, of clinical trials. So this is where we take discoveries from the laboratory and it might be new therapeutic strategies or new drugs into the clinic where we're doing the testing, where we're enrolling patients into studies. And we undertake within the New Zealand environment sort of three different types of studies. So we've got a large sort of pharmaceutical company or industry-based uh, trials. And then we've got our cooperative group or investigator-driven uh, trials. Most of the trials that we do in the New Zealand environment are what we call phase two or phase three trials. And uh, there is a talk later on this morning from, from my colleague, uh, Dr. D'Souza, looking at the area of clinical trials. But a phase three trial is where we take a new therapy, usually a new drug, and it's compared against the, the current standard of care. So patients are randomized to have either the new therapy or, not, or the conventional therapy. Phase two is where we have a new drug that is looking very promising and we, can, we, we enroll patients in the study and we compare to previous uh, sort of data. Emerging uh, across the country are phase one or early phase units. So this is where new drugs that have come out of the laboratory and are going into clinical trial. But the first question that needs to be addressed is, is this drug safe to give? What's the right dose to, to give? And is it a benefit to, uh, to patients? So the bulk across all of New Zealand is that most of the clinical trials and trials that you may have discussed with you are the industry-based uh, trials. These are usually very large, international, multi-center trials, and they're trying to improve outcomes. So they're addressing what we call areas of unmet need. In the New Zealand environment, uh, it, we use it not only to address those scientific questions, but also it's a way of providing access to novel therapies. And sometimes not only to novel therapies, just to a standard of care. And you can debate whether that's a, a failing within our health services that we need to use a clinical trial to provide a standard of care for patients with a blood cancer. The issues with the industry trials is that, in a randomized trial, is that you, know, you need to do the trial as part of the scientific sort of process but a trial may not always show a benefit over the standard of care. And the other issue is that these trials, these are for the industry. And so this was, I was at an American hematology conference and walking back to my room and here was a, an invitation to a meeting for the investors and analysts. So although the companies are looking to improve care and outcomes for patients, they also uh, have a commitment to this to their donor, to their to their sponsors, and to the people that have invested in that, and that may influence the design of the trial or how it uh, how it operates. A new issue that we haven't seen before is that, you know, as many of you know, is that you know, we have a frustration with with medications and drugs that we want to use for patients that that are unavailable to us, that are unfunded. And previously, we've used clinical trials as a way of being able to access those medications and those treatments for patients. Now we're finding is that during this area of the COVID lockdown, the lack of sort of travel, that gap between what we'd see as similar health services in Canada, the UK, and Australia, is that some of the trials that we're looking at is that patients haven't even had what internationally would be considered standard of care. So we're unable to take on those trials because patients haven't had treatment that would be a standard treatment for that patient. So those are the challenges that we have around 
the, the sort of industry and investigator trials, but they're still a really important and for us, you know, a, you know, addressing areas of unmet need where we want to improve outcomes for patients, and secondly, being able to access those novel therapies. An important part of what we do, though, within the New Zealand environment are what we call investigator and cooperative uh, group trials. So I've shown here, this is the Australasian Leukemia Lymphoma Group. So this is a group that clinicians from all the hematology centres across New Zealand are involved with, and we link with our, with our Australian colleagues. This organisation is coming up to celebrating later this year 50 years of support of, uh, of sort of clinical trials. The advantage of the investigator-driven and cooperative group trials is that you know, it allows questions to be addressed related to the New Zealand and Australian uh, sort of population. This just shows, this is from our ALOG report from, uh, from 2022, where you know, there were over 60 clinical trials that uh, were either recruiting patients or were being, had patients in follow-up, and over 900 patients in Australia and New Zealand were on ALOG uh, sort of clinical trials. As I mentioned, is that these trials that allows us, they're trials that we design and we can use it to address questions relative to our uh, sort of population. And it also allows us to provide similar standard of care across all the sort of centres, and particularly in the treatment of acute myeloid leukaemia. Our link with the UK has provided uniform care across all the uh, leukaemia treatment centres within New Zealand. Examples of cooperative group and investigator initiated trials include the development of CAR T cell therapy, and this is from Rob Weinkov, who was talking later this morning. So these are where patients' lymphocytes are taken, genetically modified in the laboratory, and then returned to the patient, having been converted into killer T cells that then can attack the leukemia and lymphoma cells. And so this has been an important advance of Rob's group at the Mulligan and Wellington developing this uh, technology, and he's going to talk about that later this morning. Some of you uh, may have been involved in this trial, which is supported by uh, LBC. And so this is a trial that we've done in the field of chronic myeloid leukemia, and it's asking the question, what is the best upfront treatment for patients with, uh, with CML? And in this study, we've taken newly diagnosed patients with CML, and they've been treated with what we call a second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor that are more potent, but have a higher side effect profile. So patients are treated for 12 months with desatinib, it's trade name Spricel, and then if they've reached their molecular target, their transition to the first generation tyrosine kinase, imatinib, and we're following patients to see if they maintain that response. So these are examples of investigator-initiated trials that are relevant to the New Zealand environment. The challenge that we face with the investigator and, and cooperative group trials is that they don't have that big industry funding. So we're always looking for, for support to fund the trials. And also we have a relatively small population within the New Zealand and even when we add the Australian sort of population. So we have to make sure that we can do a trial that can recruit adequate numbers of patients and an appropriate uh, time frame. So in addition to the clinical trials, an important part of haematology research are what we call translational or correlative science uh, studies and the basic uh, sort of sciences. And these are also important. So basic sciences is understanding the biology of the leukemia or the blood cancer or the blood disorder and drug discovery. Translational and correlative science is where you move what you do from the basic science and you move it into the clinic and use it to help guide uh, sort of treatment. This is an example of a study that was supported by uh, LBC. So this is 
the Auckland myeloid uh, gene panel study. So this is a trial that we started in patients with acute myeloid leukemia. So shown up here, here's the blood film from a patient with acute myeloid leukemia. And they all patients, they present in a similar way. Under the microscope, the leukemia has similar features. But we know patients respond differently to, uh, to treatment. What we've done with the myeloid gene panel is we've been able to interrogate the genetic profile of the leukemia cells. So it's like if you have a library that has the books that control your blood cells, that control the leukemia cells. We've been able for many years to do chromosome studies on the leukemias, which is like looking and seeing, are you missing one or two books from the library? But what we haven't been able to do is, how do we know that there's not pages missing from those books that are important, or even spelling mistakes within a page that might influence how the blood cells behave, how the leukemia behaves? So the introduction of, of a myeloid gene panel, and on the left-hand side, this just shows the number of genes that we look at, and across here is for each patient is the number of mutations or, or spelling mistakes that we see within those, uh, within those genes. So what we did with our panel was uh, we looked at 110 genes that commonly had errors or spelling mistakes in myeloid uh, blood cancers. And our goal was could we identify targets for treatment within patients? Could we uh, identify patients that were going to respond differently to treatment, either have a better response or perhaps not as good a response? And could we find a biomarker that we could use to follow the response to, uh, to treatment? And this is just our preliminary. We've now, the study opened in uh, 2019, now looked at over 600 uh, sort of patients. And this just shows what we see, this is the first 22 patients, and across the top are the individual patients. Down here are the genes. And what you can see, each yellow is a mutation or a spelling mistake within one of those genes. So you can see that although these patients all have acute myeloid leukemia and all look very similar in their presentation and their, their what the bone marrow looks like, each of them has got a different molecular profile. So it's not surprising that they're going to behave, have a different clinical behavior, a different response to therapy. And so we'd look to take that information through into the clinic so that newly diagnosed patients with mild leukemia have the assessment. It helps us with the diagnosis, prognosis, targets for treatment, uh, the, the biomarker, looking to monitor the response to treatment. And a, a new finding was that we found that around 3 to 4% of patients had an inherited predisposition to their, uh, to their blood cancer. And about 20% of patients, based on that information, we were able to change their therapy, either give more intensive therapy or move, or less intensive therapy, depending on the, uh, the profile. So that's an example of taking basic discoveries of looking at the genetic profile of moving that from the lab into the clinic. We also, across the country, have a number of groups that are looking at the more basic uh, sort of sciences, the basic biology of the leukemia, uh, animal models for leukemia, because if you're going to look at new therapies, is that that needs to be done you know, in the laboratory. We can't you know, test the patients. We need to have it to test a proof of principle and uh, drug discovery. Examples of this is that my colleague in our lab, uh, Stefan Bolander, has developed uh, uh, animal models, both in the mouse model and in zebrafish models of uh, leukemia that we can then use to understand the different molecular changes, so those errors, those mutations, how they cause the leukemia, and then using that as a strategy to potentially explore new therapies. And there's two approaches that uh, Stefan's taken. These are mouse models of leukemia, 
and what we've done here or what he's done here along, and these are our students who have, uh, have done the work, is that we've engineered, we've taken uh, leukemia cells and that have got a particular leukemia gene within them. We've then added what's called the luciferase gene. So the luciferase gene is expressed in the firefly and it, it fluoresces. So when you put it into a bioessence imager, you get fluorescence. So what we're able to do is inject the leukemia cells that have got the luciferase gene into the mice and then monitor. And then if we're trialing different treatments, we're going to get changes in the uh, fluorescence. So here's the, here's the mice. This is a, a normal mouse here. And here we've got leukemia developing within the spleen. This is a leukemia deposit within the scapula. And so these mice then can be given different treatments and then follow up imaging. And we can monitor in vivo where they're responding to the therapies. We've also used uh, zebrafish for, uh, for modeling, and we have a large zebrafish uh, aquarium within our laboratory. Here's the normal three-month-old uh, zebrafish. This is a zebrafish that's uh, transgenic, so it's had the gene. This is a leukemia-causing gene, and this is a, a fish that's developed uh, leukemia with enlargement of, of, uh, of, of organs due to spleen, due to <coughs> leukemia uh, infiltration. What we can do then with our zebrafish models of leukemia is test a whole lot of different uh, sort of medications. And what uh, Stefan and Mariam did here is they looked at what we call drug repurposing. So taking drugs that are well established, used for other reasons, and then administer them uh, to, the, to the leukemia zebrafish and determine whether there's a response to, uh, to treatment. So what you're seeing here is across the top is, uh, is uh, e each of these panels represents the zebrafish and with the, this fluorescence is, is showing up the leukemia cells. And you can look at where they've been treated and you've got a control and then the treatment, uh, it's a control fish and then the <clears throat> leukemia fish that's been treated. And these are the different drugs and we look for reduction in that fluorescence and it's shown here on the graph the blue was the control and the red is where uh, the leukemia fish that's been treated. And you can see that there's a response to some of those sort of drugs. So this is a way of looking at novel, uh, at novel therapies using drug repurposing uh, to assess a response to treatment. And if you find something successful, then that can be moved through into further studies and potentially into the clinic. So it's, what I've wanted to do is just give you a brief overview of the type of clinical research that's happening across the country and a little bit about the sort of translational and uh, basic sciences. The second thing I wanted to just raise with you is, you know, you know one of the questions that often gets asked, well, why, you know, are we competitive doing research in New Zealand? You know, surely where there's so much funding in Europe and in North America, what are the benefits to New Zealand of having active research in hematology and in the blood cancers? So there's a lot of a lot of benefits uh, for having you know for involved in research. You know, probably the most important is that in the clinical area, it gives us access. It gives our patients access to new drugs and uh, and new therapies. But I think more than that is that our basic sciences uh, research gives us better understanding around the disease. And New Zealand is able to, you know, we, we punch above our weight, we potentially make a contribution to world knowledge around uh, the leukemias and blood cancers. And finally is that we have a number of issues specific to the New Zealand environment that other countries are not going to address in their research. So it's important that we maintain active research so that we can address those issues. And one of the biggest ones that we face is around inequity and access to, you know, to health care and different outcomes that we see in different populations within, uh, within New Zealand. 
and we need to have that research here to be able to address those questions. Also, what we see is that when, you know, pay, when, when centres, when units, when departments are actively involved in research, that there's better care and better outcome for patients. So there's a number of studies have shown that units that have got active research programs, not only the patients that are on that study, but the patients that are treated in that centre, you know, benefit from it with, uh, with better outcomes. If I can show you an, uh, an example here, so this is a slide that, uh, that, that, that came from Ruth Spearing, but for over 20 years, New Zealand haematologists and New Zealand centres have participated in the UK cooperative group acute myeloid leukaemia trials. And that we've had a number of trials that's given us access to new therapies, to new drugs as part of those trials. Those trials were run through all the leukemia centres in the country. So whether you were diagnosed with your leukemia in Dunedin or in Whangarei, if you were treated, you were likely to be treated in a similar way on one of the UK studies. And what you can see is that there's a benefit of improvement. So this is, and you'll see a number of the speakers present curves like this uh, through the day. So when we as clinicians and investigators are looking, determining whether patients benefit from a study, we look at what are called Kaplan-Meier curves that look, they may look at uh, remission duration or progression-free survival or overall survival. So this is looking at here as um, the, the outcome for patients over time and here are the survival curves over different, uh, uh, over five year time periods. As you can see, you know, in the latest one, 2015 to 2018 with the AML-19 trial, which was a young adult AML trial, you can see the substantial improvement in outcomes for those, uh, for those patients. And so participating in those trials has been a benefit to, the New, you know, to New Zealand patients with acute leukemia because they've been treated with a contemporary treatment. They've been able to access new drugs as part of us being involved in those cooperative trials. The second example I wanted to show you a benefit is relates to a non-cancer blood condition called paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So this is a condition it's very rare. There's around 16 to 20 patients in New Zealand that have this uh, condition. It's where patients have uh, hemolysis. So they break down their red cells. They have ongoing anemia, symptoms from their anemia, and an increased risk of, uh, of thrombosis, of clotting. And patients with this condition have you know, shortened uh, life, life expectancy, mainly because of the thrombosis. International standard of care for this condition is this drug called ecoluzumab. Ecoluzumab is a monoclonal antibody. It blocks the complement pathways because PNH is due to excessive activation of the complement destroying the red uh, blood cells because the red the blood cells lack a complement inhibitory uh, sort of protein. With the advent of ecoluzumab, you can see that patients have a similar quality of life and outcome survival for patients who, you know, for the general sort of population. New Zealand is the only first world country where ecoluzumab is not funded. So standard of care, if you lived in Canada, UK, Australia, North America, Europe would be ecoluzumab, but it's not funded. So our patients have uh, blood transfusions and an ongoing risk of thrombosis and shortened life expectancy. We've been involved in a number of trials with new uh, um, complement inhibitors, and this is a, a, the ecoluzumab is given every two weeks by an infusion. So, for those of you who may have had a monoclonal antibody such as rituximab, you have, you have, to, have to come in and have the intravenous or subcutaneous infusion. The same with ecoluzumab. This is an oral complement inhibitor, it inhibits factor D, 
and this is a clinical trial where almost all the patients uh, came from, uh, from New Zealand. And uh, the vermicopan, the factor D inhibitor, this is the complement pathway. Echoluzumab inhibits this molecule here, C5, and it prevents this what they call a membrane attack complex that destroys the red cells. This inhibitor works up here, and this is data that we, uh, from the first nine patients, and I think all nine patients were New Zealand patients. This is their hemoglobin level. Because this is a presentation at an international meeting, the hemoglobin is expressed in grams per deciliter. So if you translate that, your hemoglobin, if you have it measured, might be 100 grams per litre or 120 grams per litre. So at baseline, the mean hemoglobin was 80 grams per litre. And following treatment, and patients continue on treatment, it's gone up to 118 grams per litre. One patient needed a transfusion early on, but the patients are all now transfusion free. And this is a quality of life score. So this is what's called a facet fatigue score. This is profound uh, sort of fatigue. And this is a significant, this is a clinically meaningful improvement in, uh, in fatigue symptoms. So this is fairly much back to, to baseline, back to normal. So patients continue on this uh, sort of treatment. So here's an example of sort of clinical trial that has been a benefit to New Zealand uh, sort of patients as well as contributing to scientific knowledge. The final benefit that I wanted to outline to you around being involved in research is around the people. And it's a lot harder to measure this, but we, you know, we need to continue to grow and generate a clinical and scientific workforce. You heard Peter in his introductory comments talk about the healthcare workforce sort of issues. It's the same issue within the, uh, within the research and science uh, sort of environment. And if you've got active research, uh, then that's going to continue to help to recruit and retain those, uh, those students, the researchers, and the clinicians. So how do we keep clinicians in New Zealand? How do we stop them going to North America or going to Australia? And one of it is providing an environment where you know, they can run their uh, research programs. What we've also realized is that during the COVID pandemic and now post-pandemic with with a lot of our clinicians and scientists sort of heading offshore is that we actually need, you know, showing us we need to develop and maintain scientific capability and resources. And not just, you know, in the research environment, but many of those scientists move into the, you know, to the diagnostic laboratory. So you look at that myeloid gene panel that started off as a research project that's now moved, that's becoming standard of care across all centres in uh, New Zealand to have that gene analysis with the uh, leukaemias. The final topic that I wanted to raise with you was, well, where are we going? What's, what have we got to, to look forward to? What are the, you know, the new changes, the things that are going to, uh, to sort of happen? So, What's our direction? Where are we tracking? So there's two big areas of, uh, of sort of advance, and a lot of these are going to come up uh, in the sessions the, uh, this morning. The first is that you know, one of the big revolutions around uh, in, the, in the blood cancers and cancers in general has been sort of cancer immunology, cancer immunotherapy. So that's using the body's own immune system to attack the, uh, to attack the cancer cells. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, Rob uh, Weinkoff's uh, development through the Maligan Institute and Wellington Hospital, their NABLE study, the CAR T cell, cell trial. So this is uh, Emily Whitehead. So she is the first patient she had relapsed refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia was treated in Philadelphia with these CAR T cells, chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells. 
and uh, and went into remission. So just to remind you that is that what we do in this strategy is collect the patient's own immune system cells, the lymphocytes. In the laboratory, they're genetically uh, modified to convert them into killer T cells that have got a receptor for the lymphoma cell or the leukemia cell. So that's so these are CAR, the chimeric antigen uh, receptor. They're then expanded and then they're reinfused into the uh, into the patient. So this is uh, Emily. So this is her after her sort of treatment where she had her CAR T cells. This is uh, six years uh, sort of later. And this is a famous sort of photo. She got invited to the uh, to the White House and persuaded the president to to write her school absence uh, note. I think <laughs> I think if you've got to have an absence note, this would be the coolest one. <laughs> yeah. So this field has moved uh, into you know into the we've got acute lymphoblastic leukemia the lymphoma, and what's most exciting, the data is looking really good, is into the myeloma uh, sort of sphere. So this is, this is a huge area of advance, and I think over the next uh, five to ten years, we're going to see significant uh, sort of progress. And huge amount of credit goes to Rob Weinkoff and his team at uh, the Maligan for their efforts in uh, developing this sort of technology. Again, sadly, you know, outside of Rob, is that you know we're still we're waiting for our direction and our leadership, uh, you know, from centrally as to introducing this sort of new technology into uh, into the New Zealand environment. There's a number of other strategies, though, using the immune system. So. Uh, for some time, and in the solid cancer area, we've had the checkpoint inhibitors. So you'll have seen these often mentioned in the media, uh, the drug Keytruda, pembrolizumab. So what that does is it unblocks blockers that stop our immune system attacking uh, cancer cells. But this is a new advance where there are a number of clinical trials that are opening across centres in New Zealand of what we call bite antibodies. So these are bispecific T cell engager sort of antibodies. So if you don't, don't look at the flipping one here, but if you look across here, this is the, uh, a cancer cell, a lymphoma cell. These are the body's T cells. So these are the T cells that are going to attack, you know, that we want to attack that uh, lymphoma cell. So in the CAR T cell strategy, these get genetically modified. So they've got a receptor and bind to that cell. What we do with the bite antibodies is that they have a part of the antibody that recognizes the lymphoma cell, so that's the bit in blue here, and part of the antibody that recognizes the T cells, and they're linked together. So what happens then is we have the antibody that binds onto the lymphoma cell, but also binds to the T cell and puts it next to it, you're right on top of the, uh, the T cell. So these are bite antibody therapy. This is glofitimab. So this is a trial that we did, uh, phase one, two trial. And it has, it's what they call a two to one format. So it's got two parts that recognize the uh, lymphoma cell. Here's showing the antibody flipping over and binding onto the, uh, onto the lymphoma cell. So these have moved in into the clinic. This is a phase one, two trial that we participated in uh, that was published in December of last year for patients with uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So these are patients that had failed at least two different types of, uh, of sort of treatment. So these are patients where we lack really other good treatment options other than the CAR T cells. Uh, and what you can see is that around 40% of patients had a response to the glofitimab, a complete response, and uh, over 50% had some form of response, and very minimal, uh, there's a very well tolerated uh, sort of therapy. So this antibody is now, it's been used in 
patients with very, very limited other treatment options, now moving, using it earlier on in the therapy and in combination with more conventional therapies such as CHOP or RCHOP bar chemotherapy. There are also bite antibodies and going into trial in multiple myeloma. So there are different centres across New Zealand are opening up those studies with these bite antibodies. So you've got the immune strategies for, uh, um, for lymphoma. The other is that you'll hear a term we call personalised haematology or precision haematology. So it goes back to those comments I was making around the gene panel. Not everybody who has acute myeloid leukaemia has got the same leukaemia. And I think it's the same with myeloma, the same with uh, lymphoma. And I think we're moving more and more to a genetic classification. And this year, new classifications came out from WHO, uh, World Health Organization for the Blood Cancers, and have got a very strong genetic uh, sort of classification. So again, if we come back, if we look this, and I'm just going to highlight a study that we're across a number of centres in New Zealand are looking to open in the next six to 12 months, and it's really based around a personalised uh, approach. So again, here's acute leukaemia looks the same under the microscope, looks the same clinically, but I've shown you, you know, that you know they're different. You know, and so the question is, how can we individualize treatment for each patient so that we minimize the side effects but improve the, uh, for the outcomes? So again, we've used the, the, the gene panel. We're wanting to identify different subtypes, provide uh, prognostic information. But particularly, we're interested in looking at biomarkers that we can use to follow a response to treatment. So traditionally, when, when we treat a patient and we determine remission, remission is defined as what, what the bone marrow looks like, what the peripheral blood counts look like. And that's sensitive to a level of somewhere around uh, 5%. But using these biomarkers, we can detect the leukemia cells down to levels of 1 in 100,000 or perhaps even 1 in a million. So this is a trial, this is uh, um, with, again, through the ALLG. So this is a cooperative group trial with Australian uh, colleagues. And interestingly, the MD Anderson, one of the biggest cancer centres in the world in Houston, are contributing, to, uh, going to join this study as well. But what it's doing, Intercept, one of the things that we have a group of people in rooms in the research lab who design the, the name for a trial. So you sort of try and take out all the bits. So you, know, you see the KISS trial was kinase inhibition with Spryce or Startup. I'm not quite sure how we came up with that. So this is Intercept. So this is investigating targeted MRD and AML for early detection of relapse and clonal evolution to guide preemptive therapy. <laughs> That's why it's easier to say Intercept. So. What this trial is doing is we're taking patients with acute myeloid leukemia who are in remission, who we've identified have got one of those biomarkers, a molecular marker. And here's the, here's the, the different molecular markers that we've got. So FLT3 or Sybil mutation, MPM1 mutation, uh, KMT2A rearrangement, IDH1, IDH2 rearrangement. We've also got JAK2 in here as well. So these are patients in remission. They're then followed, and we do regular monitoring for that biomarker on peripheral blood or bone marrow, uh, where we can detect down to levels of one in 100,000 or one in, a, one in a million. And if the patient has, if they've got emergence of what we call MRD, so measurable residual disease. So they haven't relapsed clinically, but we can detect at these very low levels a leukemia cell. Then there's an opportunity to go on to a treatment that targets specifically that biomarker. So for example, in an IDH1 patient, we would look if they became positive using our MRD analysis. So these patients are still in remission. They haven't relapsed. They're in remission, but they're MRD positive. We would then uh, commence ivacidinib. Ivacidinib is an IDH1 inhibitor, 
in conjunction with, uh, with the Netaclax. So this is a sort of a strategy you know, of you know, not just identifying at diagnosis what the molecular marker is and perhaps starting a targeted therapy. This is using it to monitor, uh, monitor the response and preemptively, before there's been a relapse, introducing a, uh, a sort of a treatment. So this is a personalized approach so that we give early treatment targeting the right change within those, uh, those cells. Finally, is that you know, if you say where's research sort of heading is that we've increasingly realized that for many people in our community and population, there's you know, different incidence of disease, different, uh, different outcomes. And uh, this is a study that was published last year from colleagues in New Zealand and Australia from the myeloma registry. So this is, this is where, again, a cooperative group trial developing a registry, collecting information. And they looked specifically at Māori and uh, Pacifica with multiple myeloma and found that patients were younger at presentation and had inferior outcomes compared to, uh, uh, to other, other ethnicities on the registry. We don't know the reasons for that. That you know, needs further research. Look, at, is there a difference in biology? Is it access to care? Is it tolerability of care? Similar data coming out of North America and Canada, again, around indigenous uh, sort of populations of you know, inferior sort of outcomes. And worldwide, there's a move both out of the you know, out of uh, societies such as the you know, hematology group, but also out of funders of research, including LBC, is that are we addressing issues that are specific to our uh, sort of population? And so I think the next uh, you know, generation or the next years of research, you know, not only are we going to look at those exciting scientific breakthroughs around immunotherapy and the personalized sort of medicine, but I think we also yes. need, thank you, sorry. <laughs> We also need to, you know, to address, um, you know, issues related to the uh, New Zealand population, and you know, within the you know, formation of the Te Whara Order, as that, you know, looking at how can healthcare and particularly cancer care be delivered in the communities. So that's, you know, with doing that, we're going to have to have research around that to assess. Is that effective? Is it changing uh, outcomes, improving, uh, improving outcomes for patients? So what I hope, and I appreciate that I've moved quickly through a number of uh, sort of topics, but you know, that I've given you sort of an overview of the type of research, you know, clinical research, translational basic sciences, uh, research within the New Zealand environment. I, I hope I've sort of shown you that, you know, that although we're a small population, that there are real benefits of us having an active research uh, and you know, having organizations like LBC you know, support our research. And not just in the clinical arena, in those correlative science and the, the basic sciences as well. And finally, just, an in, you know, just as a point as to where we're heading and particularly the immune therapies, the CAR T cells, bite antibody, and the, this area of, of personalized medicine, uh, precision medicine. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for, for listening uh, to, to me. I just, you know, this is, you know, I'm, I'm a very small part of all of this. This is just our own research group. And, uh, but thank particularly uh, sort of Stefan and Porvi who have really driven a lot of both the, uh, the gene panel studies and, the, uh, uh, and the, the animal models of leukemia. And these are our sort of uh, postdocs and, uh, and graduate students. So thank you very much. And I'm not sure if I'm allowed to have questions or not, but I'm very happy to take any questions. So thank you.
Emma's telling me we've got time for questions. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm on deck state two, so I apologise. My voice is elevated. Um, <laughs> it does calm down tonight, tomorrow. Uh, Gavin Auschwitz here, My Labour Passions. I've been involved with My Labour for a number of years. Um, the key thing for me is, and historically, there's a lot of research going around that you're doing in New Zealand, but they seem to be how they're interrelated with the, the global research now. And I gathered some of the conversations, but I also know that you've lost some of the clinicians like Henry Chan as well, who was very involved in my lab in New Zealand over the years, that have moved to, I think it was Canada. And that is an issue for us in New Zealand. And there's, and there's to me, there's, there's two components. One is the linkage of what you're doing in New Zealand for a wider sub subset of people globally, which is, seems to be lost in making sure those two are interlinked and integrated. And then the second thing is, which is the most important for me, and I'm being selfish for the myeloma patients here, is myeloma is the second most diagnosed blood cancer, not in New Zealand, but globally. But none of that is reflected in the research or very limited in the research in New Zealand. And I know from hard evidence that I was involved in myeloma in New Zealand, a few years ago on that basis and on ba and that's and then subset to that is we don't see many of the trials coming through across New Zealand and definitely not in Christchurch. I moved down to Christchurch about two years ago. So we know that's not happening and that's a big gap for us. Look, uh, fantastic, look, uh, uh, fantastic comments and uh, sort of sort of questions and um, where do I begin? The, so first off, you know, you comment around how do we build a myeloma sort of workforce and the research workforce. Absolutely, we need to uh, to do that, and that's you know you lose people because uh, you know particularly if they're active researchers, is that um, you know they'll look to you know to go offshore because they've got you know greater access to if they're clinicians, you know drugs, clinical trials, uh, or got a, a laboratory site. We are uh, looking to build that, and just with in Auckland, have recruited back uh, one of one of a, an Auckland graduate fr again from Canada, who's Roger Tiedemann, who's one of the international leaders in uh, in sort of myeloma. So we're we're looking to build a you know nationally, both on the clinical and the research around uh, sort of myeloma. But I think it it talks to that comment that I made is why do we invest in research in New Zealand? Is that you know it retains our clinicians and our and our sort of scientists and the very good ones. The the uh, the second issue is of our global links and, and internationally. Uh, perhaps that was probably my fault. I didn't maybe I didn't explain it. I think big, big belonging to the cooperative groups I think has been really beneficial. So out of ALLG is that that has underneath that has several working groups in each of the area, lymphoma, leukemia, and there's a big myeloma one. So we were involved in a number of the, of, of ALLG myeloma uh, sort of trials. And so you're absolutely right. It's, you know, we need to uh, cooperate. And that's the, that's the benefits we saw with, involved with the NCRI in the UK. The third thing is why we're not seeing those trials in, uh, in New Zealand is that uh, we as the clinicians and clinician researchers share your sort of uh, sort of frustration and uh, the, the trial that they are there but there's not as you know, um, and and we need to use it as a way of, of accessing the new drugs the bite antibodies so most of those are industry trials and so that's hard for us to sort of control we have we have to show we're active sort of researchers and we you know we've, we're good at doing those trials. I think in the, <clears throat> the, our big challenge is that unless we can persuade Pharmac to, you know, as, as again Peter mentioned, is that you know they need to have that fast tracking and change the way Pharmac. We some of the myeloma trials we're not getting because we're not able to offer the standard of care for that trial. The field has moved on a step, and we're still we're here. So that's that's a challenge for us. But look, I. I share your frustration, and uh, you know, we're working hard to. You know, we we need to, particularly, we need the bite antibody trials, and we need the CAR T trials and uh, myeloma because that's going to be you know the future pathway. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from Wanganui. 
Uh, this is not a medical issue. We all know there's an election coming up in a month. The bottom line is, how much money does this government need to put into us lucky people with leukaemia? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the thing we the thing we focus on is uh, is is drugs to access, because that's the easiest thing to sort of look at and look at what, have it, what hasn't Pharmac funded. And there, if we look through in, in haematology, we look at myeloma, daratumumab, we look at acute, acute leukemia, mild leukemia, mitostora, and if we look at human vaccine, we look at we look at CLL, ibrutinib, benoclax up front. You know, there's a, and, but it's not just the drugs, is that I think we've, we've slipped uh, five to 10 years in other technologies as well, in our bioinformatics, the, uh, the genomics, which is such an important part, the cell therapies of the, of the CAR T cells. And so I think the, the drugs is the, is, and it's probably, it's, it's the one to focus on. I, I can't answer your question as to what it needs. I think it needs, uh, I think Pharmac has been very good at, um, you know, for you know, the control of, of gene you know, the, um, generic drugs, so drugs that have come off patent and coming through, I think they're hamstrung with their budget and their processes of how do you introduce these new, you know, the new therapies, you know, that, um, you know, how, do, how do you assess those quickly? You, know, you take a drug like daratumumab, which has been sitting in front of Pharmax since 2016, uh, and now in most centres we would, or well not most centres, in North America would, you know, is moving into frontline uh, sort of treatment. Um, you know, we're still wanting to get it for second line treatment. I think there's a second part to it as well, is that uh, everyone focuses on Pharmac. I think industry, you know, these drugs are got a huge sort of cost, and so I, I appreciate the dilemma Pharmac has has I'm got. <laughs> 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 Must be time for coffee. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, yeah, there's a raffle out there. Um, Two dollars, and you know that all money goes to you know. No, just don't. <laughs> um, yeah. Clinical trials, it, it's, a, it's a huge area and certainly access to drugs and, and addressing inequality is, is underpins a lot of it. And I know here in the audience from, from Christchurch, we've got people here that are have on the smouldering myeloma study. Um, there are ones on the ALLG intervene study, AML19 ones that are still here. So yeah, there's, there's certainly a lot of research going on around the country. Now's morning tea time. So um, just to also let you know that Rob Weinkove is zooming in for his two talks today. He's recovering from COVID. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so yeah, just out the door to um, get some morning tea. And this room will be, um, like we said, adjusted into two. So just bear with. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs>